Hey guys, this is Vyom Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I will be talking about a stock that was pitched by one of the panelists in the Barron's 2022 Roundtable discussion. That stock is called Drillquip. In this video, I will be talking about the company's business by going over its 10K, then review the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios, and finally find the intrinsic value of the company. So let's dive in and review Drillquip. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at the Form 10K that Drillquip filed with the SEC. On page 5 of this report, the company talks about its business. Drillquip Inc. is a Delaware company that designs, manufactures, sells, and services highly engineered drilling and production equipment that is well suited primarily for use in deep water, harsh environment, and severe service applications. The company's principal products consist of subsea and surface wellheads, subsea and surface production trees, mudline hanger systems, specialty connectors and associated pipe, drilling and production riser systems, liner hangers, wellhead connectors, diverters, and safety valves. Drillquip's products are used by major integrated, large independent, and foreign national oil and gas companies and drilling contractors throughout the world. The company also provides technical advisory assistance on an as-requested basis during installation of its products, as well as rework and reconditioning services for customer-owned Drillquip products. Drillquip's customers may rent or purchase running tools from the company for use in the installation and retrieval for the company's products. Drillquip is organized in three geographic segments. First is the Western Hemisphere, which includes North and South America, Eastern Hemisphere, which includes Europe and Africa, and Asia Pacific, which includes Pacific Rim, Southeast Asia, Australia, India, and Middle East. The company points out that in 2020, the company generated approximately 66.7% of its revenue from foreign sales, compared to 65% and 61% in 2019 and 2018, respectively. So this goes to show that Drillquip has a good exposure to the international market. On the next page, the company gives us an idea of how the industry outlook affects the company's business. Over here, the company states that both the market for drilling and production equipment and services and the company's business are substantially dependent on the conditions of oil and gas industry, and in particular, the willingness of oil and gas companies to make capital expenditures on exploration, drilling, and production operations. The level of capital expenditure has generally been dependent upon the prevailing view of future oil and gas prices, which are influenced by numerous factors affecting the supply and demand for oil and gas, including the worldwide economic activity, interest rates and the cost of capital, environmental regulations, tax policies, and the ability and or desire for OPEC and other producing nations to set and maintain production levels and prices. If you think about what's happening today, we know that there's high demand and inflation is on everyone's mind. So the future of oil and gas prices are likely to be higher than what we are seeing today. With that industrial outlook in mind, we're likely to see Drillquip's revenue increase in the upcoming future. Now let's look at the products and services that Drillquip has to offer. Drillquip's revenues are generated from three sources, product, services, and leasing. Product revenue are generated from the sale of drilling and production equipment. Service revenues are earned when the company provides technical advisory, assistance, and rework and reconditioning services. Leasing revenues are derived from rental tools used during installation and retrieval of company's products and from leasing its foregoing facility. For the year 2020, the company derived about 70.9% of its revenue from sale of its products, 20.7% of its revenue from services, and 8.4% from leasing revenues. Drillquip states that substantially all the company's domestic revenue relates to operations in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. Domestic revenues approximated 33.3% of the company's total revenues in 2020, 35% in 2019, and 39% in 2018. Finally, the company gives us an idea of how it goes about pricing its products. It states that the company attempts to raise its prices as its costs increase, the actual pricing of company's products and services is impacted by a number of factors, including global oil prices, competitive pricing pressure, the level of utilized capacity on the oil service sector, maintenance of market share, the introduction of new products, and general market conditions. Next, the company talks about where some of its products are used, which are primarily used for exploration and production of oil and gas, such as floating rigs and jackup rigs, drilling and production of oil and gas wells on offshore platforms, tension leg platforms, and floating production, storage, and offloading monohull moored vessels. On page 10 of this report, the company gives an idea of its customers. Drillquip is not dependent on any one customer or group of customers. In 2020, the company's top 15 customers represented approximately 60% of its total revenues, and Chevron and its affiliate companies accounted for approximately 11% of its total revenues. In 2019, the company's top 15 customers accounted for approximately 52% of its total revenue, 
and BP and its affiliates accounted for approximately 10% of the total revenues. Drillquip points out that a customer that accounts for a significant portion of revenues in one fiscal year may not represent an immaterial portion of revenues in subsequent years, primarily because the customer's capital spending budget varies from year to year. So BP may be spending more in one fiscal year and Chevron may be spending more in another fiscal year. Now that we have a good understanding of Drillquip's business, let's review the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios. Hey guys, now let's look at Drillquip's key ratios. I'm on Morningstar looking at key ratios and their financials. The first item on the list is the revenue. The revenue is the top line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that the company brings in via sales. Back in 2011, the company's revenue was about $601 million. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about $332 million. Over the past 10 years, Drillquip's revenue increased from 2011 through 2014. And ever since then, the company's revenue has slowly been trending downwards. As we saw in the company's annual report, Drillquip prices its products based on the prevailing oil and gas prices. And since the current oil and gas prices are much higher than the levels that they were seen in the previous two years, we can anticipate the company's revenue to start trending upwards. At least it should be higher than what was seen in the prior two years. Next, looking at the operating income. The operating income is the amount of money that's left with the company once it pays for the cost of goods and operating expenses. Back in 2011, the company's operating income was about $134 million. For the year 2020, it was negative $19 million, and for the trailing 12 months, it was negative $39 million. So we can see that for the year 2020 and for the past 12 months, the company's cost of goods and operating expenses exceeded its revenue. If we dive down into the company's income statement, we can see that the reason why the company reported a negative operating income number was because of the decline in the company's revenue. And also, there was a restructuring expense which caused the company to report a negative operating income number. Finally, looking at the net income, the net income is the bottom line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that's left with the company once it pays for the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes. Back in 2011, the company's net income was about $95 million. For the year 2020, it reported a loss of about $31 million. And for the training 12 months, it was a loss of about $76 million. Over the past 10 years, there were three years back in 2017, 2018, and 2020 when the company reported a negative net income number. The negative net income in the year 2020 makes sense because it was a pandemic and there was a decrease in demand for oil and gas, which caused the company to report negative income numbers. However, rather than being razor focused on the accounting numbers, it's important to look at the company's free cash flow. We can see that for the same period that is back in 2017, 2018, and 2020, two of the years the company saw a positive cash flow numbers. So the company was still making money. The whole reason why the company reported negative net income numbers here was because of non-cash expenses, which resulted in negative net income numbers. In other words, the company was still making money and still had cash coming into the business, even though it reported a loss. Next, we can see that the company does not pay out any dividends. When we look at the shares outstanding, back in 2011, the company had 40 million shares outstanding. And for the trailing 12 months, that number had decreased to 35 million shares outstanding. Over the past 10 years, the company's shares outstanding number has slowly been trending downwards, which is good news for existing shareholders, as when a company buys back its shares, it actually helps increase the existing shareholders' ownership within the company. After that, looking at the book value per share, book value is what we get when we subtract the company's total liabilities from its total assets. In other words, the book value is the same thing as shareholders' equity. Back in 2012, the company's book value was about $26.35 per share, and for the trailing 12 months, that number was about $27.69 per share. Over the past 10 years, the company's book value per share has always been positive, which tells us that the company always had more assets than liabilities on its balance sheet. Finally, looking at the free cash flow, the free cash flow is what we get when we subtract capital spending from the company's operating cash flow. Back in 2011, the company's free cash flow was about $46 million. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about $7 million. Over the past 10 years, there were two years, that is back in 2020 and 2012, when the company had a negative free cash flow number. Given the cyclicality of this business, it's not uncommon to see such fluctuations in the company's free cash flow. And in order to even out these fluctuations, I will be using the past 10 year average of free cash flows for my discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Now let's look at the profitability of the company, focusing on the net margin. The net margin is the ratio of the company's net income to its revenue. So it compares the company's bottom line to its top line. Back in 2011, the company's net margin was about 15.84%. What this means is every $100 that the company made in sales in the year 2011, by the time it paid for its cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations and taxes, it had $15.84 left as pure profit. For the year 2020 and during 12 months, the company has negative net margin numbers because the company has reported negative net income numbers. Next, looking at the return on equity. The return on equity is the ratio of the company's income to its shareholders' equity. 
Warren Buffett prefers to only invest in securities that have a return on equity of 8% or greater every year for the past 10 years. Back in 2011, the company's return on equity was about 10.87%. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was negative because the company's income was negative. The three ways of increasing the company's return on equity numbers is first by buying back shares, which drives down the company's equity portion. Second is by taking on debt, which drives up the company's debt and hence decreases the equity portion, which increases the return on equity numbers. And third is when the company makes more money, it can report an inflated return on equity number. After that, looking at the return on invested capital, the return on invested capital gives us an idea of how good the management is at allocating the company's capital and getting a return on that investment. Back in 2011, the company's return on invested capital was about 10.83%. And for the train 12 months, it was a negative number because the company had a negative net income number. It's important to understand that just because the company has negative net income number does not mean that it's junk. If you look at the company's cash flows, we can see the cash is still piling into the business and the company still has a viable business model. In other words, the net income number is an accounting number. It includes the non-cash expenses, which drives down the company's income. However, when we look at the cash flow statement, we get a truer picture of how much money is actually coming into the business. Finally, looking at the interest coverage, the interest coverage is the ratio of the company's income to its interest obligations. So it gives us an idea of how many times can the company pay off its interest using its income in that calendar year. We can see that the company has high negative interest coverage numbers, which ideally is not something we want to see. However, when we dive deeper, we can see that the company has little to no debt. Additionally, the company has a lot of cash on hand. So even though the company reported a negative net income number, which is the reason why the company's interest coverage is negative, but in reality, the company is in a good shape of meeting its interest obligations. Now let's look at the financial health and liquidity ratios. The first item on the list is the current ratio. The current ratio compares the company's current assets to its current liabilities. Ideally, we want the company's current ratio to be greater than 1.0. It's even better if it's greater than 1.5. A current ratio greater than 1.0 tells us that the company has enough assets to fulfill its liabilities over the next 12 months. Back in 2011, the company's current ratio was at 5.29, and for the latest quarter, it's at 9.01. We can see that Drillquip's current ratio is excessively high, which is a good thing when it comes to economic turmoil. We know that having a high current ratio means that the company can survive any economic downturn. However, this also tells us that the management may not be doing its best job at allocating the company's capital. Next is the quick ratio. The quick ratio is similar to the current ratio except we disregard the inventory component. In other words, quick ratio is equal to current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's quick ratio was at 3.17 and for the latest quarter, it's at 6.45. Ideally, we want the company's quick ratio to be greater than 1.0, as that tells us that the company does not have to rely on selling its inventory in order to fulfill its current liabilities. Both the current and quick ratios tell us that the company is liquid and is not in a liquidity bind. And if there were an economic turmoil, the company can easily survive for the next 12 months. Next, looking at the financial leverage. The financial leverage is the ratio of the company's total assets to its shareholders' equity. A financial leverage of 1.0 tells us that all of the company's assets are financed via shareholders' equity. A high financial leverage tells us that more of the company's assets are financed via liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's financial leverage was at 1.17, and for the latest quarter, it's at 1.12. Over the past 10 years, the company's financial leverage has stayed consistent. Finally, looking at the debt-to-equity ratio, ideally we want the company's debt-to-equity ratio to be less than 1.0. It's even better if it's less than 0.5. However, in the case of Drillquip, we can see that the company does not have any debt, which is why we do not see any numbers being reported for the debt-to-equity ratio. Now let's look at the efficiency ratios. The first item on the list is the day sales outstanding. This number gives us an idea of how many days go by from the day the company recognizes its sale to the day it actually receives cash for that service rendered. Back in 2011, the company's day sales outstanding was about 103 days, and for the train 12 months, that number was about 108 days. Ideally, we want the company's day sales outstanding number to be staying steady or decreasing. What we do not want to see is a company whose day sales outstanding number is growing rapidly, as that tells us that the company may be aggressive with its accounting as it's trying to recognize its revenue sooner so that it can inflate its income numbers on its income statement. However, in the case of Drillquip, the management does not appear to be playing any such accounting tricks as the company's day sales outstanding number has been trending downwards since 2018. Next, looking at the day's inventory, this number gives an idea of how many days does the company's products sit in its inventory before they're sold. Back in 2011, the company's day's inventory was about 263 days, and for the trailing 12 months, that number was about 308 days. Ideally, we want the company's day's inventory number to be staying steady or decreasing, as we do not want to see the company's inventory just sitting around on its balance sheet. We rather see that inventory being pushed onto the income statement and flow through as profit. 
Finally, looking at the payables period, this number gives an idea of how many days does the company take to pay its suppliers. Back in 2011, the company's payables period was about 34 days, and for the training 12 months, it was about 68 days. Ideally, we want the company's payables period to be staying steady or decreasing. What we do not want to see is a company whose payables period is growing rapidly, as that tells us that the management may be holding on to its cash in order to artificially inflate its cash flow numbers. We can see that the company's payables period did see an increase in the year 2020, which could have been due to the pandemic where everyone was trying to hold on to the cash. So even though the company's payable spirit is increasing, it's not growing at a rapid pace where it's a cause of concern, but certainly something to keep an eye on. Now let's look at the company's valuation. The first item on the list is the price to earnings ratio. Drillquip does not have a PE ratio because the company's earnings were negative. The company's price to book is at 0.9. The company's price to sales is at 2.6. The company's price to cash flow is at 51. When we compare Drillquip's current valuation to its five-year average, we can see that on the price to book, price to sales, as well as price to cash flow metric, the company is undervalued now compared to its five-year average. Finally, let's look at the company's discounted free cash flow DCF analysis to find the intrinsic value of the company. Over here, I pasted the company's 10-year average free cash flow that I got from Morningstar. I used the 10-year average because of the cyclicality of the company's free cash flow associated with the business. So the company's 10-year average comes out to about $66 million. I'm using an annual growth rate of free cash flow to be 5%. What this means is I expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 5% every year for the next 10 years. The company's discount rate, I'm using that to be 10%. What this means is I want this investment to give me a 10% return. Said differently, I want to double my investment in seven years. Next, I'm using the long-term growth rate to be 2.125%, which is in line with the 30-year treasury yield. The company has 35 million shares outstanding and has no long-term debt. After taking all of these inputs into account, we get the company's intrinsic value to be about $29.39 per share. And when we compare this intrinsic value to the company's current stock price, which is at $24.47 per share, we can see that the company's current stock is trading about 16.7% below the company's intrinsic value. The way we calculate this intrinsic value is we look at what the free cash flows would be every year for the next 10 years. We sum up all those free cash flows, which come out to about $515 million. Then we look at what the free cash flows would be after the 10 year mark into perpetuity. We sum all those up to get the intrinsic value to be about $1,028 million. From this number, we subtract the long term debt, and divide by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value per share to be about $29.39. If we disregard the perpetuity component, in other words, if you think that Drillquip is only going to grow for the next 10 years and then it'll cease to exist. Then we get the intrinsic value without the perpetuity to be about $14.73 per share. And since the company does not have any debt, the intrinsic value without the debt is the same as we saw earlier, which was at $29.39 per share. Finally, let's try to figure out what kind of return can we expect to get on the security if we were to invest at the current stock price. For that, I will set my intrinsic value to its current stock price, which is $24.47 per share. By changing my discount rate, I'll run this analysis, and it comes to about 11.46%. What this means is if I were to invest in the security at the current stock price, I can expect to get an annual return of about 11.46% on this investment. In short, Drillquip is a deep value stock. The company is undervalued not only from a discounted free cash flow DCF analysis standpoint, but also the fact that the company is trading below the company's book value. Drillquip's current market cap is about $866 million, out of which the company has about $375 million just sitting around in cash. What this means is more than 40% of the company's current market cap is in cash. Additionally, Drillquip is debt free, and all of this makes Drillquip a great candidate for acquisition by some of its larger competitors in the oil and gas services sector. Lastly, Drillquip operates in the oil and gas services sector, and it depends on the capital budgets that companies such as Chevron and BP have for exploration and drilling. And if those companies start moving towards renewable and clean energy and start cutting down on budgets associated with exploration of oil and drilling, then the company's revenue is likely going to suffer, which could lead to a decrease in Drillquip's stock price. If larger oil and gas companies start cutting down their budget associated with their upstream business, which includes exploration and drilling, then the existing oil and gas service providers, which includes Drillquip and its competitors, are likely going to consolidate. And given Drillquip's clean balance sheet, it makes Drillquip an even better candidate for acquisition. Hey guys, that is all I had for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on Drillquip interesting. If you like this content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions on which stock I should review next, Please leave it in the comment section below. I'll greatly appreciate it. Thank you.